Yeah, thank you very much for this kind introduction and thanks also to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my ideas here. All right, so lists are non-narrative, dry and mundane. People tend to skip them when reading. They belong in the prosaic realms of accounting and statistics and should have no place in literary narratives. In short, they're boring and have no literary value. Such seems to be the common opinion when lists appear in literature. Today, I would like to make a case for the merits of the form of the list and explore its narrative potential. The form of the list is arguably uh, situated at the fringes of narrativity. Yet, detective fiction, a heavily plot-driven genre, teems with lists of suspects, lists of pieces of evidence, of questions and of rational conclusions and it frequently has lists appear in key moments of the story. As diegetic parts of the story world, lists tend to contain or conceal information vital for the solution of the case. As paratexts, for example in the form of the table of contents, or as I will discuss later on, the score sheet, they involve the reader in the act of detection. It is the liminal statues of lists and other paratextual elements, so Gerard Jeanette argues, that allows them to negotiate relations between text and reader, often by framing or contextualizing the texts they surround or intermit. My paper today will argue that lists in detective fiction inhabit a liminal status between narrative and appellative device, and thus provide unique abilities for readers to interact with texts. In their narrative capacity, Lists serve as representations of a character's cognition and illustrate processes of consciousness or rationalization. On the other hand, lists that are more directly addressed to the reader often fulfill what I would tentatively call a ludic function. Ludic lists cast the reader in the role of detective and invite a non-linear interaction with the text that makes use of the dynamics of play. In my presentation, I will first briefly analyze how the novels of Agatha Christie use lists as a narrative element and then contrast this with Dennis Wheatley's crime to see novels from the 1930s in which lists serve to involve the reader in a game of detection. Finally, I will argue that an engagement with the liminal status and the versatility of the form of the list can help us avoid binary thinking and thus open up new possibilities of interpretation that take into account how readers engage with texts. The novels of Agatha Christie team with lists of suspects and motives, with profiles, hypotheses, and timetables, and with lists of unanswered questions. Very frequently, such lists appear at times when the investigator assembles crucial information. In Christie's 1950 novel, A Murder is Announced, for example, her detective, Miss Marple, leaves the following list of clues behind before she mysteriously vanishes. And you can see that highlighted here. Lamps, violets, where is bottle of aspirin? Delicious death, making inquiries, severe affliction bravely born, iodine, pearls, letty, burn, old age pension. This list contains all the clues that helped Miss Marple identify the murderer, yet it leaves both the characters in the story and the casual reader baffled and confused. Does it mean anything, anything at all? I can see any connection. The character who finds the list comments. Miss Marple's list represents her thought process as she jumps from one piece of evidence to the next, aligning each with her suspect. The sequence of words appears as a mental checklist, reducing each item to an informational core. This process of reduction eliminates the connecting principles, such as chronology or causal logic, that holds the clues together from the perspective of the list maker. And the rapid succession of items mimics the speed with which the pieces of the puzzle fall into place for Miss Marple. Similar to direct speech, this written list of thoughts lacks a mediating instance. The immediacy that this list affords provides direct access to Ms. Marple's thoughts and seems to condense and assemble all the important pieces of information in one place. At the same time, it conceals the pattern that connects the items and thus conveniently leaves the reader in the dark about Ms. Marple's conclusions. This list of questions, 
uh, the list of questions that Detective Hercule Poirot writes down in Murder on the Orient Express similarly reminds the reader of a number of important clues and it also shows the progression of Poirot's thoughts. The questions build on each other. Why do the hands of the clock point to 1.15? Was the murder committed at that time? Was it earlier? Was it later? Thus, they let the reader take part in Poirot's reasoning process. The fact that both Ms. Marple and Poirot write their lists down on paper reveals that they use lists as a device to focus and preserve thoughts, and thus also contributes to the impression that the lists represent their unmediated thoughts. Like other repre representations of consciousness, the lists in these novels stretch discourse time and slow down story time. But even though lists frequently arrest the continuous progression of plot, they, in this case, contribute to creating a key narrative element, suspense. They do so by opposing knowing and not knowing, by assembling clues as signposts to solutions all in one space at the same time, and by still obscuring the logical relation between them. The lists thus demonstrate to the reader the seemingly impossible task that the, tef the detective is faced with. They leave uh, they leave the reader both curious about how this seemingly impossible task will be solved and worried that the character might fail to do so. In detective fiction, lists involve the reader in yet another way. The gaps they leave contain an implicit appeal to become active and fill them without the help of the detective. In conventional detective fiction, this activity is optional. The solution will be revealed in the end regardless of whether the reader guesses along or not. My next case study takes this potential for interactivity to an extreme and indeed suggests that the case may go unsolved if the reader does not make an effort to become involved in putting the pieces together. And I actually brought you the thing because it can be hard to imagine what it looks like. So the most interesting bits are the green post-it notes. <laughs> so. Um, Dennis Wheatley and Joe Links's murder dossiers that were published during the 1930s advertised their innovative and interactive approach to the genre. The dossiers consist of real document notes, witness statements and inventories collected in the form of a police dossier. And they leave it mostly up to the reader to piece together the plot. Two elements in particular distinguish them from other crime fiction of the age. First, they include actual material clues so objects supposedly found at the crime scene, for the reader to consider and engage with. And second, they explicitly asked the reader to do so. Especially the first murder dossier, which, is, which I'm passing around here, uh, places great value on the immediacy and authenticity that is thus achieved. By including paratextual instructions, such as the prompt printed on the jacket to be your own detective, an authorial preface that explains to the reader how to properly interact with the text, and a sealed section with a solution at the end of the dossier that addresses the reader directly, Wheatley's crime dossiers aim to merge the roles of reader and investigating officer. Throughout the volumes, the material clues contained in the dossiers increasingly require the reader to not only closely observe, but interact with them to learn what secrets they conceal. The first volume, for example, requires the reader detective to spot a suspicious object in a photograph of a crime scene. In the second volume, the smell on two perfumed sheets of paper serves as a clue, and the fourth and last volume contains a secret note, the invisible writing on which only becomes visible if the paper is dipped in water. This kind of processing evidence goes way beyond the role of an attentive reader that more conventional detective stories require. The element of interactivity necessary here to reach the desired goal, so to find the murderer and solve the case, is much more typical of games than of stories. The focus in the murder dossiers shifts increasingly from emulating authentic case files to engaging readers in a game of detection. This, for example, becomes evident from the score sheet that becomes included in the fourth murder dossier. <coughs> The score sheet is accompanied by an author's note that instructs the reader on how to fill it in and on how to award points for each suspect correctly eliminated. This paratextual note bears great resemblance to game manuals that aim to introduce players to the rules of board games. And the fact that several score sheets are included suggests that this game of detection is meant to be played by more than one player. 
The author's note explicitly states that eight solution sheets are provided so that each member of the family may fill one up. They even warn against cheating. No peeping now. But cheating is hardly possible if we assume the role of the reader is to merely follow the story. Encouraging several players to trade their hand at solving the murder case and awarding points for correct solutions also invites competition between individual players or readers. The purpose of awarding points is to make individual approaches comparable and let the player who scores the most points emerge as the winner of the activity. Interactive engagement with material, being able to compare one's performance to that of other participants in an activity, and the element of competition are highly unusual elements for storytelling, but uh, standard features of competitive games such as Clue. Players of Clue are supposed to proceed by the same principle of exclusion and comparison as readers of the murder dossiers in order to solve tasks such as find out who killed Mr. Body in the greenhouse with a paper knife. The difference between the two is more one of degree in presentation than one of kind. By showcasing its ludic elements and de-emphasizing the narrative core, the murder dossiers blur the boundaries between narrative and play. Now, what about the lists? I argue that lists are essential in organizing the ludic elements in these stories. It is no coincidence that both Clue and the murder dossiers use list-based score sheets to track the progress of the players' and readers' investigations. Lists afford order and are apt to provide a structured overview over large quantities of data. In the Agatha Christie example I gave earlier, this ordering function is primarily available to the detective character, but in the murder dossiers, the lists are meant to provide an overview for the reader. The list form of the score sheets in both the murder dossiers and Clue provides a pre-structured grid that directs readers in how to collect evidence and, through limited space, ensures efficiency and clarity for note-taking. Lists organize and categorize knowledge. This is easily visible in the murder dossier score sheet that gives away how many clues can be found and divides them into sufficiently and partly reliable. The fourth murder dossier's entire structure is neatly divided into several distinct sections that compartmentalize the elements of the story. Roughly the first half of the dossier consists of chronologically ordered police files compiled by an officer on duty at the location of the crime. As a sort of appendix, this list is followed by all the material clues to be investigated, each labeled and listed as Exhibit A to P. Subsequently, the dossier presents a series of photographs of all the suspects, followed by a section that contains a short profile and biography of each of the people photographed. And at the end, there's the sealed section with the solution. This list-like way of presenting content pre-sorted into categories, so files, photos, evidence, and profiles, encourages an engagement with a material that is inherently non-linear. The sectioned list format makes it easy to go back and forth between photos, reports, and pieces of evidence without losing time locating items, and thus affords easy comparability and cross-referencing between the separate types of evidence. Only a non-chronological engagement with the material presented, a going back and forth between pieces of evidence, profiles and files, can forge connections that lead to the murderer. This non-linear format is a frequent feature of games. Think, for example, of how the story world of many computer games can be investigated in a random order. It, however, seems to run counter to linearity as a key feature of narrative. Regardless of the presentation order of events, which can skip back and forth in time, at least on the reception end, these stories are marked by a clear and unalterable progression from beginning to end, as indicated by the consecutive numbering of pages, which incidentally is also missing in the fourth murder dossier. One can observe a clear development in the murder dossiers, a shift from a focus on authenticity and fair arrangement of the clues that all detective stories of the time share, to an approach that transforms the reader from a mere observer into a surrogate protagonist. By addressing the reader as a protagonist and asking questions such as, can your powers of detection lead you to the murderer? Wheatley's murder dossiers aim at heightening the stakes by implying that readers have direct responsibility for solving the case and righting the wrongs that have been committed. Casting the reader as detective plays on key assumptions and expectations that detective fiction is based around. 
Much of the special appeal of the genre is derived from the idea that the power of reason can explain everything and that any chaotic arrangement of seemingly disconnected objects, such as the list that Ms. Marple makes and the murderers announced, will eventually yield the objective truth that, that hides behind it and if only the right method is applied. Detectives connect the dots and unveil the bigger picture, making the world explainable. Placing the reader in this position implies that the seemingly objective knowledge detectives unearth is potentially accessible to everyone. Lists in detective fiction serve a dual function. In some contexts, they unfold their narrative potential, and in others, they serve as a primarily ludic purpose to engage the readers in the act of detection. This distinction, however, is by no means a binary one. More so than other formal elements of a fictional text, lists seem designed to offer the reader interactive potential. Thus, even the primarily narrative lists in the novels of Agatha Christie invite the reader to play detective and put the clues together before the protagonist reveals the solution. Furthermore, lists that serve a primarily ludic function generally also manifest a narrative dimension. The lists of personal belongings of the murder victim that the first murder dossier includes not only provides the reader with the possibility to spot the item that is odd, but also serves to characterize the victim. Even the clearly ludic score sheet included in the fourth murder this year can help the reader detective reconstruct later on how certain suspects were eliminated and thus contribute to rearranging the separate sections of the dossier into a more coherent, causally connected order. The short and simple form of the list contributes to this immensely. Lists order and categorize. They unify disparate elements, condense information and enable its neat but variable arrangement. The conciseness of this form makes it an ideal tool for cross-referencing and comparing content that can be applied by characters and readers alike. As narratively liminal devices, lists are neither narrative in the strict sense of providing linearity, causality and coherence, nor are they entirely situated outside the realm of narrative, because they can create suspense and provide access to characters' thought processes. Their liminal status makes lists a good tool for negotiating between seemingly opposed positions and can thus help to avoid binary thinking and, as a consequence, open up great potential for innovation. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>